Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the blessings of today. And God, uh, you're so real to us, Lord. And, and we're so thankful that we can be in your presence and find joy and find peace everywhere you are. So God, uh, be with us. Be with our pastor. Lord, uh, he, he just hates to miss church. And of course, of course, Lord, you know that. So Lord, I pray you'll comfort him tonight. I pray, Lord, you will strengthen his body. And I pray, Lord, that he will soon get over this viral infection. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I appreciate you being back uh, tonight for our third and final message on the prayer series. Prayer series is entitled Prayer Matters. And uh, I think uh, we have uh, we've gone through a lot on prayer. We started with uh, the example, the greatest example, and that is Jesus Christ. As he showed us how to pray, he showed us when to pray, and he showed us why to pray. And uh, if, he, if he puts in places that much importance on prayer, then I think we ought to as well. And then last week we dealt with prayer in the scriptures and how important it is to utilize God's word and combine and partner with prayer uh, and uh, how it can be effective uh, in our prayer life and how it can be affected in our over life, overall journey of life. So tonight I want to uh, d uh, preach on this subject tonight. Prayer is a powerful thing. If you believe that, would you just please say amen? amen. All right, I believe you're awake and uh, you're ready to listen and, and ready to dive into God's Word. Let me begin by saying that prayer is a wonderful privilege. You understand that, right? God has opened the door of heaven. Matter of fact, he has opened the door to his throne room and he has invited us into his presence with our petitions. Folks, that's a privilege. Now this scripture I'm going to put up on the screen is so powerful and it's so, uh, so you, you need to, to make this verse a motto of your life. And it's found in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. And it says this, let us therefore come sheepishly. Is that what it says? Let us come tiptoeing in. It's not what it says. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. We've been invited to do that, folks, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Not only have we been invited into his presence, into his throne room, but he has also promised that he would hear us when we call. When we pray to him, he will hear us. It says in Jeremiah 33, 3, this familiar verse, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. And then he promised to answer our prayers. So we've been invited into his throne room. He's asked us to call upon him, and thirdly, he has promised to answer our prayers if we pray according to his will. Now, there's an important verse that we find in 1 John chapter, 4, chapter 5, verse 14 that says, Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, not our will, you got that? According to his will, he hears us. So folks, prayer is a privilege, and prayer and promises go together, but I want to remind you tonight as we dive into Scripture that prayer is a powerful thing. And we're going to be looking in uh, the book of Acts, the 12th chapter, and I know it's going to be a familiar story to you, and we're going to read the 24 verses there here in just a moment, or we're going to go through those verses, and we're going to see that prayer is a powerful thing. Now I want us to ask Daniel if prayer is powerful. You know, he, uh, he looked towards Jerusalem and he, would, he prayed for three day, or three times a day. And he kept that up and that was what he did every day. And so I asked him if prayer was powerful. Well, when he was in that lion's den, what did God do? He shut the mouths of the lions. So I believe Daniel would tell us that prayer is powerful. What about Elijah? He stood on Mount Carmel, and you remember he was there against the prophets of Baal, and he prayed this prayer that people would know that God is God and that he is the only God. And then this happened. The fire of heaven fell. So we can ask Elijah if prayer is powerful. 
What about Job? We know Job went through an incredible uh, uh, catastrophe in his life. He lost everything he had. And we find that he bowed down and he worshiped God. And he said this, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And you can go through the book of Job and you can see the conversations that he had with his friends and you can see the conversations he had with God. And I promise you, Job would testify tonight that prayer is a powerful thing. Well, what about Jonah? You know, he lived in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. How many of you believe he started praying when he first got in there? I believe he did, and if you'll read chapter 2, you're going to note, you'll, you'll note that prayer of Jonah chapter 2. And when he gets to the end of that chapter, it tells us, I believe it's verse 9, it says that he returned, Jonah returned to the vow that he had made to God. And after he had returned to that vow, that's when that great fish spit him up on dry ground. There's a bird, there's a plane. No, there's a runaway preacher. Hits the dry land, and he goes and he does what? God wants him to do. But all of those were what I would call private prayers, and we've all had private prayer. We've all got in our closet, and we've all got in our, our prayer closet, if you will, and we have all poured out our hearts to God in private prayer, and God has answered us in the power of His glory on many, many different occasions. But the passage we're going to deal with here tonight in chapter 12 is a prayer that is a corporate prayer, and we're going to find that there is power in corporate praying. There is power in when we come together as individuals, as a church body, there is power in our praying. And so I think there is a special dynamic that comes into play when God's children come together. Even as we are united here together tonight and we can unite our hearts and we can be in agreement that God, that, that prayer is a powerful, powerful thing. Now let's look at... Uh, this passage here in chapter 12 of the book of Acts. And I'm going to read the first five verses, and uh, then we'll go through uh, the outline here tonight. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison. Now the first thing I want you to see that there is that there were problems. There were some problems. But after we see about the problems, we're going to see that there was prayer and after we see about the prayer, we're going to see that there was power. And I want you, if you, I do have that on a sheet there if you'd like to get one, if you don't have one. And I think if you'll uh, take those and, and read it uh, this week, it will help you in your prayer life. So let's think about there, that there were problems. First of all, there were attacks. We read here that James, the brother of John, one of the Lord's inner circle, he was put to death by Herod. Now, Herod was a very wicked man. Herod was uh, from a line of uh, a lot of Herods, and they were all wicked, if you will. But also, Peter had been in prison, and he was sitting on death row, and he was, he was awaiting his time of execution. Not only uh, was James killed and Peter put in prison, but uh, the Jews would press their attacks upon the church. They hated the gospel that was being preached. They hated this thing that was called the way that has been propagated. And so uh, they would persecute the early church. Herod even persecuted the other church because it gave him a political advantage. And so we see that there were attacks, but there was also apprehension that I find here in these first few verses. The church didn't even, they didn't know what the future held. They were pretty much, uh, I think that they were pretty much full of fear and they were concerned for the future of the church. You see, what they had done, they had left their Jewish roots and they followed Jesus Christ. So they were paying a price for following Jesus. 
But not only were there attacks and was there an apprehension upon their part, but there was also an adversary. We read of one here, a human by the name of Herod. We read that he was uh, very wicked. He was uh, uh, the one, as I mentioned, that killed James and arrested Peter. But we also find that his actions pleased the Jews. So Herod and the Jews, they were, they were uh, partners and they were responsible for the persecution that was going on. But folks, they were merely human instruments. Because you see, there was someone behind the scene. His name was Satan. Satan is the one who organized. He was the one that compelled them to persecute the church. And I want to tell you this. Satan hates the church of the living God. Satan hates the gospel that the church preaches. And I'm talking about the true church of God. Let me put it like this. God, uh, Satan hates Rye Hill Baptist Church. Folks, we preach the Word of God. We have a pastor that preaches the Word of God. Satan hates that. We have a church that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. Satan hates it. And also, Satan hates the fact that we worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we find that there is an adversary. But I want to tell you, the church still finds itself in times of trouble even to this day. We are under attack. Probably some church people are apprehensive. Probably some church people are, are full of fear because of the attacks and the persecution. And listen, folks, we're not being persecuted at all like the early church was. Now, that day may come, but there's so many that are apprehensive. And, you know, the Bible says he did not give us the spirit of fear, but of that of a sound mind. And, and so we need to understand we don't need to be apprehensive. But the adversary, Satan, he is there. He is in our world today, and he is doing everything in his power to disturb and disrupt the harmony and effectiveness of our church. He doesn't like what's going on at Rye Hill. He hates our message. He hates our master. He knows that if he can turn us against one another, he can shut down our work. But, oh, hey, listen, that's why we preach unity and harmony. We, need, we always need to be edifying one another and building one another up. The devil knows if he can fill us with fear over the attacks that we face, he can stop us from serving the Lord. And he knows that if he can fill us with fear over the future, he can keep us mired in the past. Listen, folks, we're under attack, but there's something we can do. You know what it is? As a church, we can pray. So in this particular chapter, in this chapter 12, we find that there was prayer. Not, I don't want us to focus on the problem so much. I want us now to focus on the prayer that was going on. And if you'll notice here in verse 5, it says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but... Now that's an important word. That is a contraction or a conjunction. And it is... Uh, it is a, a powerful word. The situation looked desperate, but it looks as though Peter might be put to death. But it looks as though the church might be overwhelmed with problems. But notice what it says. Constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Now that word constant really has the idea of praying without ceasing. And it tells us to do that in Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. And here we find that prayer was made without ceasing. And that word ceasing means to stretch forth. And it's, it's a medical term that refers to a stretched ligament or a pulled muscle. And really what it's saying is that it, it gives us the idea of going beyond the boundaries. And when we apply this to prayer, it's a picture of, of fervency. And so that's the first thing I want you to see about this prayer. It was a fervent prayer. I love what it says in James chapter 5 verse 16. You'll see it on the board. It says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective or the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, the phrase effectual fervent means energetic, passionate kind of praying. It's not lifeless. It's not unconcerned. It's not, it's not casual. It's not half-hearted. It's not blasé. It is a passionate, energetic kind of prayer. 
And I believe this kind of prayer moves the hand of God. And it will continue to move the hand of God even in our day. And so we see here it was constant. It was without ceasing. But also, you're going to see that it was offered to God. It was a faithful prayer. Not just a fervent prayer, but a faithful prayer. They had a source in which they looked to, and that source was God. You see that there, do you not? The prayer was offered to God. What happened here was they joined their voices together, and they reached together to the very throne room of God. Remember, God invited us. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. So this church, as one... They touched God for the church and for Peter. Folks, when we pray, we must pray in faith. Now, there's a couple of scriptures I want to share with you about faith and prayer. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, you know this, this, this passage. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must come to him, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we need, to pray in, we need to pray in faith. And then in Matthew 21, verse 22, it says, And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Can I remind you of something? Remember, when you're, when you're praying, you're actually talking to our Heavenly Father. Now, now get that in your mind tonight. When you're praying, you're talking to our Heavenly Father. And here again, He delights in listening and answering our prayers. But not only was it a fervent prayer and a prayer and a faithful prayer, but it was also a focused prayer. Notice again in verse 5, it says, Prayer was offered to God for Him. Now you'll notice the word him is not capitalized, so it's referring to, it's not referring to Christ, it's referring in this particular passage to Peter himself. And so they they have a focus on an individual. And that individual was Peter, because Peter had been put in prison. And so the church come together and they began to have a prayer meeting. And so they came together to pray for a Pacific purpose. And I like to th- and I like to tell you tonight that we have a lot of general kind of praying that that goes on. And I don't believe there's anything wrong with general uh, generalizing our prayer or throwing a blanket over a lot of things like we pray for our nation. We pray for our government. We 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 generalize that to a certain degree. But I believe that God is really interested in our specific kind of praying. And this church in this particular instance prayed and focused their praying on one individual, and that individual was the Apostle Peter. Now, it was not only a focused prayer and a faithful prayer and a fervent prayer, but I want you to see in the last part of that verse, verse number five, that it was also a family prayer. How many of you are so thankful that uh, everyone here at Rye Hill Baptist Church, we're a family? Do you think of it like that? I hope you do. My goodness, what, a, what an incredible family we have. And you know what? The more we have come in, the more I like it. The more, the, the, the bigger it gets, the greater the family gets, and I love it. But folks, we are a family unit. And God is wanting us to gather together to pray. And so as a family, this church, these Jewish people, these early Church people, they got together as a family and they joined their hearts and their hands together and they lifted their voices to God. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. He moved. God moved. And He moved in power. Now I want to remind you of a couple of things. There are a lot of people in our church family who are facing life-threatening illnesses. Y'all know that, right? I think we need to be touching heaven for them. We'll mention names tonight. They're in dire situations. We need to be touching heaven for them. There are others that have gone wayward or they have backslidden. I like that old Baptist term, backsliding. Some of them have backslidden. Folks, we need to be touching heaven for them. 
There are others who are struggling with needs. They have problems in their life and they have burdens. Folks, we need to be touching heaven as a family for them. And you know what? If we'll just take a minute, we'll do, that. we'll do it here in a little bit. Just think of the names and faces of our brothers and sisters that stand in need of prayer. Folks, we're going to touch heaven tonight. Aren't you glad we can do that? We're going to go boldly to the throne of grace. And we're going to go on their behalf because we're a family. Not just our pastor, we can specifically pray for him, but we, we mention these names because we want to specifically target these particular needs. So there were problems, but there, were, but there was prayer. But I want to excite you with one other thing tonight. And I've got a few minutes to finish this up. There was power. There was power. There was power. Do you get it? Because of this prayer, there was power that was manifested. Now let me read to you verses 6 through 11. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping. I love the fact he was sleeping. He was bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly! And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And you know, when you're kind of half asleep, that's probably kind of the situation you'd be in. When they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. Folks, there in verse 11, we find that there was a powerful deliverance. Listen, when the church prayed, God heard them and he answered their prayer. Peter was miraculously delivered from prison. It was a divine intervention. And here's why. God saved Peter because the church asked him to do it. Did you get that? God saved Peter because the church asked him to do it. Folks, that to me is a powerful deliverance. I wonder what we would see if, if we would pray as a family like that. I wonder who might be saved. I wonder who might, uh, what he might do among us. He might show us those great and mighty things. If we just come together as a family. I love what it says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Listen, God did it, but the people prayed. Listen, we want to see miraculous intervention on behalf of a lot of our loved ones and a lot of our church family. Let's continue to pray. Amen. But not only was there a powerful deliverance, but there was a powerful surprise. Notice in verse 12 through 17. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. There's where we get the fact they were, they were praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. You can pencil in the word surprise there if you would. They were surprised. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go, tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. I love this story. When Peter was released, that angel came, released him from prison. He went to the house where the church was praying. 
He knocks on that gate and Rhoda comes and she doesn't open the gate. She recognizes his voice. She runs in and says, hey, Peter's at the door. Peter's at the gate. Oh, you're crazy. Rhoda, Rhoda, there is no way. He's dead. He's dead. No, no, it's Peter. Then they say, oh, it's got to be his angel. Because back then they, they believed that, uh, that angels, that everybody had a guardian angel and that that guardian angel could assume the very identity of that particular individual. And so they were thinking, oh, it's just, it's just an angel impersonating Peter. <laughs> and I love, I love a quote that Warren Wearsby had. And it said, God could get Peter out of prison, but Peter couldn't get himself into the prayer meeting. And that's certainly true. But then they began to investigate the situation and they discovered that it was Peter himself. And the Bible here says, they were astonished. They were surprised. <laughs> Man, why were, they, why were they so amazed? Why were they so surprised? They had been praying about this. Folks, I'm, I'm going to say that a lot of times... Sadly, that our praying is done in an atmosphere of unbelief too many times. Remember I mentioned too, we've got to pray in faith. We need to be praying in faith. But on our best day, sometimes our, we're marked by a lack of faith. But you know what? I praise God that my faith does not have to be perfect. My faith just needs to be exercised. We need to exercise our faith as we pray. You remember the father that had the demon-possessed boy, and he came to Jesus in Mark chapter 9 and verse 24. He said, Lord, would you help my unbelief? We need, to, we need to pray like that. Lord, help my unbelief. But folks, as long as, as we live in this world and we speak to God in prayer, listen, we're going to often be surprised by his answers. Even when we're praying about it, and sometimes it takes God a while to answer that prayer, sometimes we're, we're just astonished, we're just surprised. But listen, God is able. God is able to provide. So there was a powerful deliverance. There was a powerful surprise. But lastly, there was powerful sovereignty on display. Oftentimes we, we end there in verse 17 or verse 18, but I want us to read 18 through 24 very quickly because I want us to catch the end of this story. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and he stayed there. Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus the king's personal aid, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod, get this, he's arrayed in royal apparel. He sits down on his throne, and he gave an oration to them. He gave a speech to them. He began to talk to them. And the people began to shout, and they kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. What were they doing? They were, they were proclaiming Herod to be a God. But listen, God proved sovereign over the opposition. Who was the opposition? It was Herod. God proved sovereign over him. Herod the king who dared persecute the Lord's people, it tells us here in verse 23, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him. He's there, he's in all of his array, and he's sitting on his throne. And the angel of God comes and he strikes him because he did not give glory to God. And then the most, <laughs> one of the most gruesome ways to die, I would think, right in front of everybody, it says here he was eaten by worms and died. God orchestrated that. And listen to me, folks. That was a lesson to the church that day to leave the enemies in the hand of God. And it's the same lesson we need to learn today, to leave the enemy in the hands of God. 
It was a lesson that day designed to teach them that God was greater than anyone or anything that they could ever face. And folks, the same is true for us today. Our duty is to serve the Lord faithfully and leave the opposition to Him. You remember what David said when he was facing Goliath? He simply said, the battle belongs to the Lord. You're Goliath in the hand of God. But one last thing, verse 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Now that seems like a, an unusual verse to be put into the ending of a story, right? Boy, I'm going to tell you something. That just proved God's sovereignty over the outreach, over what was going on in that day and that time. Because the Word of God grew, and it said it multiplied. So folks, when we think about prayer, we think about praying like it matters, and we think about praying like Jesus did, and we think about praying with Scripture, we must think that prayer is powerful, and that God is still in control. And I want to just say this in closing, prayer matters. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.